When I first met Adri Roberts, it was hard to believe what she had been through. It was 2015. The young woman I was interviewing was talking about her experiences with psychosis and homelessness. For years, she had experienced delusions. Friends and family had drifted out of her life, scared of who she was. Then one day, friends took Adria to the hospital to seek help. She bravely shared her story with me to be published in the local newspaper. She was still under treatment, but felt like she was getting better every day. Back then, Adria's goal was to use her own experiences to help other people by training to become a peer support worker. I recently caught up with Adria to see what she's been doing since we met and what's next for her in a world where we all seem a little more tuned in to mental health issues. I'm Greg Lechek, and this is Revisited, a visual podcast about reconnection. Each episode, I interview people I'd written about as a reporter almost 10 years ago. We talk about what they've been up to in the last decade, how it relates to when we met, and what direction they're pointed toward moving forward. For a bit of fun along the way, we create a photography project together, creating a snapshot of us now that will live into the future. Today, Adria Roberts. Uh, well, thanks for taking the time to be here today, Adria. Thank you for having me. So when we first met, uh, it was when I wrote the newspaper article. It's the first time you shared your story publicly, is that right? That's right. Yeah. Um, and it was a cover story, and you were 26 years old, and uh, you're sharing about schizophrenia. So how was that for you? I think it was overwhelming the first time I decided to share my story for that article. I didn't know I was going to be on the cover, you know, like I finally felt like I was heard and I hadn't felt like I felt heard until then. So very emotional. I know there was some friendships that had gone a little rocky because they kind of just shut me out, assuming the worst of me. They came back and apologized. That was really huge for me. I started to get opportunities to share myself, but the the first big opportunity was I was asked if I would share a TED Talk for the first ever Chillac TEDx. And I also noticed uh, at that time that when I did share with others, a lot of people appreciated it, that they could relate, kind of help normalize what they were going through that maybe they weren't comfortable with sharing. When I share myself, it kind of helps me process what I've gone through and kind of move forward every time, a little bit. I was reached out by British Columbia Schizophrenia Society and they had a program called Strengthening Families Together, which was helping uh, family members understand their, what their loved one's going through. So I started sharing with them at their events. Is there a balance between advocating and telling your own story and your own recovery? I think a couple of the things that I did notice that came up for me with it was I started to kind of create my identity that uh, who am I except that I have someone, I'm someone who can share that I have schizophrenia. This is my value, is this diagnose that I kind of never wish I had. <laughs> it was defining. It was defining me and I was, um, I didn't want it to be my identity. And then another piece of it was because I was sharing so often, um, I was feeling too vulnerable, but I kept telling myself to do it and become vulnerable all the time and that maybe I needed to become stronger with my vulnerability by just continuing the behavior. Eventually, I came to a spot where I didn't want to share anymore. I've even made it my career. So <laughs> I was like, there, I feel like I can't escape it now. And I kind of wanted to tunnel and isolate away from it. I was diagnosed in 2013. 
And then, yes, in 2019, I came off med medications, which that can be a touchy subject. Very important to have professionals support you with those things. Um, and I stopped hearing voices that year as well. And I don't know exactly why. I did make a lot of changes in my life, so I am assuming that helped. My mom passed away. That was heavy, hard. I didn't know how to cope. I decided to start um, kind of being mindful with my eating. I started uh, intermittent fasting. And then I started going to the gym, started weight training. At that point too, I, I did change, um, like my work roles changed. I was doing peer support. I ended up going into management. So I just started learning new skills, trying to be a little bit more diligent with parts of my life. Yeah, be a lot more mindful. So what are the key lessons you've learned over the last decade about recovery? So within the last 10 years, the key things that I've learned one of the things I always say to myself is recovery is not linear. It's it's messy. Sometimes it's in waves. Sometimes I've been thinking it's like this. It's like who knows what's going on. It's not always about, oh, I'm doing better. Sometimes it could mean that, oh, I'm having more challenges now or my environment is harder than it was. Another thing I talk about is community. I still struggle with community connection, but I have seen how much it has helped me. Part of my recovery is based off of support from the community. What are your thoughts on stigma around schizophrenia? Stigma around mental health. I feel a little bit conflicted with like how I view that. Part of it, I think there's more dialogue and conversation happening with uh, talking about mental health and that, you know, this is quite the norm for a lot of individuals to struggle with their mental health. The other piece is, even though I think it's a, a bigger conversation, I think that it still has a lot of stigma, a lot of judgment, a lot of negative thoughts. It's really hard once a word has a negative connotation on it to pivot how others view that word. What would you like to see more of with regards to maybe community acceptance or yes. people's awareness? I would love people to start celebrating their successes in life, uh, especially in regards to mental health, because it can be very easy to be down on yourself. I get down on myself where even if I am succeeding, I'll think, oh, but there's still this going on that is troublesome or an issue, or I could, you know, somehow work on my mental health better. You know, when you're struggling, it's easy to beat yourself up. It's really hard to stop that behavior yeah. and, like, take the time to appreciate what you've gone through. And I'm saying that to myself. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and what about, and you say success a few times there, Mm -hmm. what, is, what is success? I mean, because oh. that's a word that means different things. To different that's people. so true. I think a big piece of it is me still going, keep going, and me being kind to myself and pausing. And sometimes success might mean that, yeah, I tried really hard to, you know, work on something and have growth. And then other times it might mean that, you know, I just took a day and it was okay to let everything just kind of fall apart and that was okay to have that day too. It's okay to struggle. It's okay that these emotions and feelings, thoughts rise up. I think a lot of time when those things come up for us, we look at them as a negative, but they're just indicators to let us know, you know, that there's a lot happening for us right now. And I think it's easy to judge it rather than to kind of look at it and be like, hmm, there's a reason these things are showing up. Tell us what you do now and how you, how you kind of got into the field. Initially, um, I was not working at all after my diagnosis. I didn't know if I would ever work again. I just remember thinking, this is it, this is my life. Um, 
I'm on disability forever. And I didn't have a lot of hope for myself. So I was connected to the local clubhouse and they were offering different resources. So I started going to those different classes, not really expecting much would happen from attending, but at the same time, like I had nothing to lose. And then I took this training, it's called RAP. It's about making a wellness plan for yourself. There was this one topic and it was, um, there was five key concepts and one of them was personal responsibility. And I don't know why, but for some reason that really like uh, stuck out for me. And I was able to say, I have stopped having personal responsibility for myself. No wonder my life's not going anywhere. I've given up. And for some reason that just really pivoted my thinking that I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna make some effort now. After I took that training, they had told me, you most likely won't get a job out of this. So I kind of went in there knowing that, but I thought, I, I need all the tools I can get right now. I'm okay taking the training and just learning how to better support myself. Um, so then it was over a year later, they came back to me. So it was eight hours a week, and I found that really challenging. And I was still struggling a lot with my mental health, but you know, things started to progress. I was able to work more hours eventually. I think maybe a year or so later, I was up to 30 hours a week. I um, switched into management. Mm. So that's being really good, but really a lot of work. Is it? Yes, yeah. it's, it's, it can be a heavy space. And then you're supporting a lot of other individuals too, like staff as well. All the people that um, I work with, they're all amazing. All our peer support workers, they all are so kind, so empathetic, so unique, so much compassion in our program. It's through the roof. I'm always like in awe of the people that I help support, like the, the workers, the staff but also the um, participants, the people we support in different areas. It's, it's challenging to be professional, but still be vulnerable, like um, peer support work is at the same time. It's, you have to be really mindful. Extreme, it's an extremely mindful job. Another part of my current story is I have two jobs. So, okay. In some sense, it's not sustainable because I have two jobs. The other job is mental health based as well. It's um, working for a supportive housing society. Then I realized having downtime is extremely important for your mental health, for your physical health, it's really important. So tell us a little bit about how you got into face painting, how it helps and why you share. It's very acceptable to face paint for Halloween. Most people have done it once or twice in their life. So I felt, you know, kind of safe to experiment within that season then. And then, I don't know, I, something got a hold of me that month where I was like, this is a thing for me. I have never been comfortable sitting with myself so intimately, um, but somehow with face painting, it was okay. It's where my spirit, my mind, my body, and my emotions, they all are kind of able to connect to each other. And it's like a, I'm finally able to have that cohesive space with all parts of myself. I'm willing to see if the universe pivots me another way. Um, if it pivots me to art therapy, which I feel like might be a good fit, that would be really cool. But if it doesn't, I'm equally as fine. I'm just really happy with where my life is at now. I've definitely felt so much gratitude. I've had so much gratitude reconnecting with you. It's almost like, wow, I can't believe that happened. But also it's created a pause in me to reflect, oh, a bunch of things did change for me since that time period. And it's such a blessing to come and kind of share that journey. Well, that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much for coming to share your story again. We've already finished the first part of our photo project co-creation, so we'll, um, we'll meet up soon to finish that and uh, show our listeners and our viewers what, uh, what that's all about. Yes. 
Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> So welcome back, Adria. We uh, we have the prints from the photo project up here on the wall. So I wanted to talk to you about these a little bit. It was really fun doing this with you. Yeah, it was an adventure. Yeah. So I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about the technique. I took pictures of you at your house with um, with your face paint with studio lighting, mm -hmm. and then I went home and I reversed. I flipped the the film. So these are all double exposures with the second exposure shot through the back side of the film, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. And that's why you get these red casts, these orange and red casts. I love that. It was downtown Chilliwac. Mm -hmm. We walked around. And um, why did we go to those places? We were kind of going down memory lane for myself on like what my journey has been like for me. A huge part of it has been struggling with my mental health and like what did that look like physically, right. literally, yeah. um, from being in a, being homeless out in community and transitioning eventually to housing right. and then eventually even going to spots where I was actively in recovery. Okay. and having you know better moments happen for me right okay good yeah so all of the places that these photos were taking were meaningful to you yes very on on your journey meaningful and lots of emotions yeah. attached to the spaces yeah. um i do see a lot of sadness lingering mm. a lot of sad energy in a lot of these shots but that doesn't upset me at all it's more like Acknowledging, yeah, there's a lot of disappointment in my journey and not knowing how to cope. And <sighs> some of my journey was quite miserable. <laughs> Lots of it was, but I don't look at it as a negative. I appreciate that it's being seen, not silenced. So, yeah, so tell me why this particular um, face painting piece for this shoot. A large reason why I'm attached to the murals out in community is because when I was struggling with homelessness in my hometown, there was very, I don't even remember any murals existing. Those bare walls were uh, spaces of pain, abuse, lots of different things. So it was, it felt extremely negative in my mind, those spaces. And then when I started to see murals popping up in spaces that I used to look at as negative, I was like, wow, it's almost like uh, there is a, um, a transition happening in these spaces. Like what I am looking at as a negative space has blossomed into a beautiful space. Like that's that happens in life a lot of times, like where there was a fire, now there, like the forest burns down, the fire destroys it, but then regrowth happens and brings something beautiful. It can show that there can be change in spaces that feel like there might never be change. Right, oh. mm -hmm. that's a good way of putting it. I like this one here especially. I'm not extremely, um, attracted to how I look in this photo. I think my um, my countenance, I'm almost a little bit uncomfortable with how it looks. And then the fact that the, the mirror really vividly showed through mm -hmm. and all we're seeing is actually what is behind it anyway. Almost like a, not a magnifying glass, but I just, it makes me think of um, my struggles with delusional thinking in that location. I hung out many times in delusion, feeding my delusional thinking often. So then having like this mere kind of energy kind of is paying homage to that part of my brain that went through that time period. I wouldn't say that I'm comfortable with the image, but it really speaks to me. Mm -hmm. I feel like it really pays attention to my journey somehow. And I love that, I love your point about it makes you feel uncomfortable and maybe that's a strength. It's like right. powerful if you can make someone feel something 
different, yeah. maybe a Absolutely. little bit uncomfortable. And yeah, and then aesthetically, I just, like you said, this space that this whole quarter, that the mirror lets us in like a window to the space that you, that was a part of your life. Mm -hmm. And you directed this one very I carefully. Did. You, I wanted it from that branch angle. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. So yeah, and, and again, I just wanna, I will say like this process is, I mean, the frames don't even line up when we're, when we're doing that second flipped exposure. Mm -hmm. So the, I couldn't, you, you're usually aiming for like three to five good you're shots like, in a roll and hopefully <laughs> it works out. And this, I think we had, how many did I send you? 30. 30, 30 frames. Mm -hmm. So it's just random and it was just incredibly lucky. This one I, I want to say is my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there's a little bit of distrust in my face and um, maybe like warrior energy, which when I face paint, I often feel like my warrior side comes out. Remind me this again, this was very directed by you. Yeah. Did you paint part of this mural? Yes, I got offered um, to paint a tiny part of the mural. So your, your contribution to this mural is approximately there. <laughs> I think you didn't know exactly where it, it was. It felt like it yeah. was pretty much the spot. If I'm off a bit, not much. Yeah. And I, yeah, I feel like this one is like the, str it shows almost strength in a sense, like the facial gesture is very strong. It's definitely in my top three, maybe my, my favorite as well. The one that you're asking, what well, was my favorite outside of, mm -hmm. I think, I think it'd be this one. This is the one where your eyes are closed. It's a, it's a vertical portrait and it has, actually that's a reflection in the puddle of the. I was wondering if it was a reflection the, or the, if it was up. The, the electric pole and wires. Um, Very cool. I love portraits like of people with their eyes closed, not just in myself, but I'm always, um, I always find them so, there's like something comforting about shots of people with their eyes closed. Mm. I guess it's more of like a namaste space, more inner child smile, more zen kind of energy to me and I love that. And I really like it here and I personally have a bit of uh, clown energy to me so I feel like this is represented because it shows so much of the face paint style um, the color tones are very carnivalesque yeah this one is probably my favorite I love how one of my eyes has that um, I want to say iridescent glow to it and then the other one's very matte and muted I love the contrast there's a part of me that feels this is my core side the most. Of course, I was telling you how excited I was that you incorporated um, like the top piece of the police car. Yeah. And the focus, like the background is like where I used to live with the stairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as you're saying, it's, it's just the top of a police car in the yes. foreground with the stairway up to your old mm -hmm. apartment um, and that's kind of a fence or something that's dividing your face and <laughs> that's yeah. so cool i didn't notice that it aligned so perfectly we also when you were shooting got to talk to a police officer which was really cool for me because when i was struggling with my mental health at at my worst i was terrified of police officers like i felt like they were the enemy and very fear-based around them and I had had a police officer um, stop me on the road and ask if I needed help and I made up some lies and um, I could tell they were hesitant to leave me, but they did. And I wish I had told them the truth, um, but hmm. I didn't. Um, and then later on in life, I've publicly shared to police officers at least a dozen times and just had really honest conversations with them. Uh, That's, yeah, a very impactful one, I think. And mm -hmm. it was right up there for me. It, 
maybe should go in this if I picked yeah, an eight, let's take, eighth one. Let's take that one away. Oh. Which one? <laughs> oh, that, that one. This one? I love that one, but it, it's, like I said, it makes yeah, me uncomfortable. Too. So yeah. I'm like... <laughs> yes, let's do it just as a, <laughs> okay. a rep physical representation that we changed our mind. I'll take that one out and put oh. this one in. Is that what you're saying? Yes. The truth about life is you can't, you are allowed to change your mind. So that. That's an active edit. Active this is an edit. ongoing edit we have here. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, yeah, and... and to that, I loved that conversation, bumping into that police officer and hearing you talk about your past. And he was really interested. He was genuinely interested in hearing. It. He was genuinely interested, and he didn't have to be. This is a, an incredible series, and we, I just can't believe how many frames lined up in a way that not only were, because I mean, it's a balance, right? It's got to have the aesthetic that you are interested in or that anyone would be interested in. Right. But it also has to be meaningful to you. That's kind of the whole point, right? That kind of makes it challenging. Yeah. But I guess I'm curious if other people will um, connect to, the, to it like you and I do, like yeah. we did. Yeah. But does that mean others will, will have to see? And I hope it does. I think a lot of this just resonates that we're all human and, you know, there's many pieces to who we are it's not just one thing yeah it's a great place to end it thanks so much for doing this with me thank you yeah. that's it for this episode of revisited thank you for joining and please be sure to check out more